Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez. And on this episode, my co-host, David Begin, and I are going to discuss the importance and how to address root cause problems rather than just fixing symptoms. And why is this crucial for the long-term success and sustainability of your small business? It's about the difference between just fixing the symptoms versus identifying the true root causes and solving those root causes to finally solve a problem that might be persisting in your business. This episode is a re-release of the original episode 200. I've added some additional content here at the start and also have done some editing, but it's one of my favorite episodes and on a very important topic, I think, because we're all challenged as small business owners with really solving problems on a daily basis and understanding and needing to understand how to really solve the real problem and not just the symptoms of a problem in our business. To get more information about the How of Business, including the show notes page for this episode, and to learn more about my one-on-one -on -one and group coaching programs, please visit thehowofbusiness.com. I also encourage you, wherever you might be listening to this episode, to please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. So I want to share with you five tips that I have found to be really effective to helping us as business owners focus on solving root cause problems and not just symptoms. Number one is embracing a problem-solving mindset and culture. Now, the mindset, of course, starts with you as the business owner, your leadership team. But over time, if you take this approach, ideally what you develop is a culture within your organization that strives on, that focus on, focuses on trying to solve root cause problems and not just the easy fix of addressing symptoms. I encourage you to educate yourself and your team on systems thinking. In other words, encourage a shift from linear thinking, ABC, to systems thinking. How are things interchangeable? How are things integrated? How are things interdependent? So it involves understanding how different parts of your business are interconnected and how they affect each other. One thing that I do here, is it going to impact or how does it impact something else within my system? So by seeing the business as a series of systems, interdependent systems, then you as the owner and your team members can better identify root causes of problems instead of just addressing the symptom. When we look at one thing that has happened, if we look at the entire system, we're better able to identify what might be the root cause or root causes of that problem. And then, of course, as in any environment that's healthy, I think you got to promote continuous learning. Continue as the leader of your business to foster continuous improvement and learning. Encourage your employees and your team leaders, your management to always ask why when problems occur. And then push deeper to those underlying causes. Ask those five layers of whys. And that you will find that that approach, that culture will lead again to more problem solving, root cause problem solving, as opposed to just dealing with symptoms and then having those issues come up again and again and again. Number two is utilize, as I just mentioned, root cause analysis tools. So the five whys, I just mentioned the five whys. This is a technique, it's been around for some time now. It's simple, yet a very effective technique where you ask why multiple times, typically up to five times or so. It just depends on, on the depth of the problem until you get to that root cause of the problem. And, I, you know, it's it's hard to determine exactly how do you know when you're at the root cause. But I think that in most cases, what I've found is you'll know. You'll know that you'll have that aha moment or your team will that, okay, this is probably the root cause problem. It's certainly deeper if you get to that point than where you started, which is at the symptoms layer or the end results of that root cause problem. So it's a pretty straightforward method that can be used without any kind of specialized training. Everybody can learn how to do this. Again, it's a matter of instilling this in your team and then creating a culture around it. We always ask why. If this particular component or equipment or whatever it is, is continuously having problems, 
instead of just saying, well, let's fix it, let's just fix it, why is it continuing to have problems? Well, it's because the supply to it or the connection to it is faulty. Okay, why is that faulty? So you continue to ask why questions within reason, right? A, a fixing something in an organization, you don't always have the luxury of spending a lot of time on it. So that's often why we end up just addressing symptoms. But where possible and where it makes sense, especially if it's something that's occurring on a regular basis or it's an expensive thing, an expensive maintenance item, for example, it's well worth applying the five whys technique. Number three, collect and analyze data. So gather comprehensive data. And this collection of data is what's going to help you identify, is there really a trend? Is there something bigger going on here? So use those data analysis techniques to gather information and be able to track. And over time, you might well identify a root cause problem. In this episode that'll follow here, you'll hear me and David share a couple of different examples of how we've used this approach of gathering data to help us analyze a root cause problem or, or identify a root cause problem. Number four is implement preventative measures. So especially if you have an environment where you have maintenance of some sort, equipment of some sort, a fleet, uh, tools that are expensive, machinery, those type of environments in particular, develop a preventative maintenance strategy. Once that root cause is identified, work then on identifying strategies to prevent the issue from occurring again. And this might involve a process change. It might involve additional employee training or new policies, but that's part of that developing preventative measures. And then item number five or tip number five is to foster open communication and collaboration in your work environment. So encourage that team involvement in the problem solving technique and using the five whys and encourage them not just on speed of fixing a problem that'll end up being just fixing a symptom, but that people take time, especially in those critical areas to try to identify the root cause. Now it could be that it's something that's mission critical. We've got to get this piece of machinery back up and running as quickly as possible. And so in those scenarios, I understand you're going to fix the symptom. You're going to get things back operational. But perhaps your process then is to analyze that and then do the root cause analysis to see how we can't avoid or fix something deeper that's leading to that malfunction on a regular basis. Part of step five is to create a blame-free environment as much as possible. So ensure that the focus is on solving the problem, not on assigning blame as to whose fault is it that this keeps breaking or that we keep having this maintenance issue. A blame-free environment encourages more open and honest communication, which is crucial for identifying and addressing root causes. Also, be careful what motivation or incentive you're creating through compensation or other rewards. Going back to the point of speed, if all you're focused on and all you're compensating, incentivizing, or motivating your team to do is to quickly thing, get things back operational, and that is important, I get it, especially in certain environments, but be careful that that then doesn't reward or encourage a behavior where it's all about symptom solving, and no root cause analysis or solving. So by focusing on these strategies, these five strategies or tips, as a small business owner, you can more effectively solve the underlying issues affecting your business. And that of course leads to a more sustainable and profitable opportunity to grow your small business. And so now here is that conversation that I had with David Begin, my co-host. David is a serial entrepreneur, a management expert, and consultant. And he and I discussed this topic of fixing versus solving on this episode of The How of Business. Welcome to this episode of the podcast. This is Henry Lopez and David Begin. This episode is a topic episode. We're going to dive into this concept of fixing versus solving a problem. It could be related to equipment, could be related to people. But what does that mean? David's got some, some good insights on this topic. And so we're going to chat about that. It can be applied to any business, any environment, really. And it's something that we all struggle with. David, I'd like to start with uh, fixing and solving and, and providing at least a definition in the context of this conversation as to what we mean by those two 
Yeah, so I've been thinking about this concept here recently because it in our in our world it seems like we deal with mostly problems. You know, when when if you're in an operationally intensive business, you're dealing with the things that are preventing that business from being 100 percent operational, and so you're you're fixing problems quite a bit. So you're you know you're in the you're in the mode of trying to fix things. And so uh, listening to a podcast a little earlier uh, last month about fixing versus solving problems made me think about as I manage my business, what am I really solving and what am I fixing? And I think as owners and as top level managers, you got to get people thinking more along the lines of solving problems rather than just fixing problems. Fixing problems is easy to do, right? So if you were to define that, I think if you fix a problem, it means you solve the problem, but there's a chance that problem could come back again relatively quick. And you could you could have multiple reiterations of fixing. Where if you decided to solve a problem, you know, you took the steps necessary to try to prevent that problem from happening again. And so I, I look at it as you explained fixing is dealing with the symptom, kind of when I take an over-the-counter drug for a cold, right? I'm, I'm, I'm addressing the symptoms versus solving is about really addressing and digging in and, and looking at the source of those problems. Is that fair? Yeah, I think that's very fair. That's a great example where you might be, you know, you're taking a cold medicine, but maybe you get a cold every, you know, you get a cold in the winter, uh, every every year, and it lasts a, uh, a month or so. Mm-hmm. So what are you doing to yourself to put yourself in a situation? So you're masking the symptoms so you can feel better, but are you actually trying to address the problem of why do I get colds in the wintertime? And what can I do differently in my life or lifestyle to try to prevent colds from happening? It seems to me that the reasons, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons, but some of the reasons that come to mind for me as to why we tend to fix things as opposed to really solving things is a couple of things, money and time. It's a lot faster sometimes to just address the symptom, to fix the thing that I visually see is broken and not really dig into why does this thing keep breaking. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think our society is based on quick fixes. I think we're really focused and our marketing, everything we see is based on quick fixes. Um, You know, I can fix this, I can fix it quickly, and I don't have to worry about it. But I think in the long run, as we well know, with many things, quick fixes don't necessarily always work. It's easy too. It's easy to fix something and I can check it off my list. I can feel better. I don't have to put the time, energy, and effort into trying to really say, what's the root cause of this problem? And what can we do to, to address that root cause so it doesn't happen again? Yeah, but- I think I, I think you can also you fall into it's it's a what's it called a, a spin a, a spiral downward because the more we focus on just fixing things, let's talk about it from a mechanical perspective first, from an equipment perspective, and then we'll talk about people. It, it's almost like really we're not addressing the deeper, uh, maybe more expensive problems. And it just seems like all I'm doing then is fighting the fires of fixing this and fixing that and fixing that instead of taking the time to really address the problem. Right. To solve what's going on. Right. 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 And it's hard to solve the problem. And sometimes the problem is insolvable, but you have to put a lot of energy and effort into it with trusting the fact that in the future that's going to pay off. Yeah. You're you're, going to see that future benefit, but you don't get that immediate gratification when you fix something, you know, when you solve something, you don't always get immediate gratification where if you're just fixing something, you get that. Can, can you give me an example, particularly at the car wash where, where this happens a lot, where you can fix a component, something that, you know, maybe touches the car, but, but really what's leading to that particular part or component breaking often is either an overall design flaw or something else that's going on before or after, you know, that's related to it. And I have to dig into that. Give me an example of that where you've seen that recently. Can you do something that comes to mind? Equipment is a big one. It's a huge issue and a huge topic when it comes to this. You know, when you're fixing a piece of equipment, uh, if you're constantly having to fix the same piece of equipment in the same way, then you got to ask yourself, is there a design flaw? Is there a problem with what we're, we're doing, how we're executing on it? Is there a problem with how we fix it? And really taking a look at that. And I would say the vast majority of our staff from, from a good place wants to fix something. They want to get it fixed. Mm-hmm. They want to get it off That's their right. list. They want to get the equipment up and running. But you know, at the end of the day, we might be spending a whole lot more money fixing the problem than if we tried to address the problem uh, for the beginning. M- motors and pumps is a great example you know, where we're trying to fix the problem. So give you an example, car wash, we, we've got a lot of hydraulic hoses that run the equipment in the tunnel. 
And if we were fixing hoses that leak, you know, we're putting ourselves in a situation where hydraulic fluid could leak on a car, causes problems, could shut down the wash. Uh, you get some very irate customers when their car gets a lot of hydraulic fluid on it. You could, you can try to anticipate and, and fix the hose when it happens. The way we've addressed that in solving that problem is we just replace all the hoses once a year. Mm, so we, we, we don't we don't want that as a problem. So we just set it up that we buy new hoses and once a year we replace all our hoses so we don't have to worry about it. And that does solve the yeah. problem if it's done correctly that uh, that we don't have hydraulic leaks. But that, that costs a little bit more money. Maybe it's a, a perception that it does because in the long run, I probably spend more, but but I need to go buy all those hoses and spend the time to replace them. Is that one of the reasons some people don't do that? Yeah, it's, it's one of those maintenance items that some people forget or don't think about and say, well, we'll just fix them as we need to because they don't want to spend the money on it. Uh, it does take some time and we'll, we'll take an amount of time to make sure the hoses get replaced. Yeah, similarly, you know, we've had a challenge with one of our freezers just play freezers at our yogurt shop. And and really, sometimes we're addressing just a symptom there as opposed to the problem, which we haven't been able to quite fix, which is heat buildup, where we put it, uh, it's enclosure, uh, it's against the window that gets the afternoon sun. So all of those things add up to it overheating, right? That's really how we would solve that problem, but we keep just fixing the thing when it breaks down or it builds up dust or whatever. And so we, it breaks and we got to fix it instead of solving the problem, which is that we should be cleaning it more often. It should have been put somewhere else. It needed more ventilation, those kind of things. So you can apply this in, in all environments, right? Right. right. It, um, as to how we tend to fix as opposed to solve the issue. And it's hard to ask somebody who works for you to say, solve the problem because they, they think they're yes. solving it by fixing it. So sometimes mm-hmm. fixing it's okay. Maybe you make that conscious decision that fixing it's going to be fine. And we know somewhere down the line, you know, might break again, and that's fine. It's, it might be a quick and easy fix, and we're okay with that. But if it becomes burdensome, if it becomes a quality problem, if it becomes an issue where your car washes or your shops are down, then I think you've got to start thinking about what do we need to do to really solve this problem. One one example I heard from uh, this lady, Brooke, who did the podcast, talked about her subcontractors not submitting invoices on time so she could pay them. And you know she'd do a bunch of things to try to get them to do it. But she finally set a policy. She goes, if you did work for me, you must submit an invoice within 24 hours or you're not going to get paid. And wow. so that solved the problem. So now she has no <laughs> issues with people getting uh, bills to her in a timely manner. Uh, but talk to me a little bit more about what you just touched on and how you develop your managers or others who are responsible for maintenance since we're talking about that. How do you instill in them and help them develop that ability to dis- discern between fix and solve and to ask that deeper question? How do you teach them to do that? Well, you you it's tough to teach them to do that. I think you've got to have conversations with them about what they're fixing and why they're fixing it. And then part of it is you've got a good system that keeps track of how often you're having to fix something because your memory starts fading after a while and your memory is inaccurate. So we've got motors that we replace quite a bit on tire brushes and uh, tire shine machines. It feels like I'm replacing a motor all the time. Well, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. So if I'm replacing a motor once every two years, that's probably a reasonable the expectation that that motor is probably going to fail in two years and I'm going to have to replace it. To me, I feel like I'm replacing them all the time because I got, you know, eight or nine of these motors sitting on different car, various car washes. Yeah. So I said, didn't we just replace that or are we replacing that quite a bit? I mean, that's that's problematic because I don't I don't have an answer to that. And usually I rely on the the manager to tell me, no, we haven't replaced that in a year. We haven't replaced that motor in two years. Never replaced that motor. So I'm having to rely on their memory. If I had a really good system that can keep track of that type of stuff, I think it'd be really helpful to go back and say, when was the last time we did that? And then I would say, is two years, for example, a reasonable time frame between a failure, a a motor failure? So if I decided that, then that that's my expectation. But if I'm replacing them every few months, then again, the the maintenance person or the site manager would be very willing to just put a new motor on and declare victory and move on, mm-hmm. right? Because they fixed the problem. Right. But it could be that the wiring the going from the motor to the to the motor control unit is not correct. Maybe we've crossed wires. Maybe the wiring is is wearing out, and we've got to replace it. And uh, those are the things we've got to think about. And again, they might not think about that. They think, okay, I got to 
the motor's not working. I've got to replace the motor. I've replaced the motor. I've done everything I need to. Yeah. And that, and again, that, that's such a key point. And I've, I've had this challenge with people I've worked with and people who have worked with me and for me is it's very easy and quick to say, well, let, let's just replace it and buy a new one. Not only can that be wasteful because maybe the thing can be fixed, but it also, I think, undermines this thinking process of identifying what's really the source, if there is one perhaps, that's really causing this, especially if it happens on a regular basis. So that thinking, I think we, we have to challenge our managers to ask those questions, to think through that and not just automatically say, well, we'll just replace it and move on to the next thing that's broken. But what you touched on, of course, was systems. And that brings to mind, we have to mention, of course, that we, we're implementing the car wash operating system, which is a task and maintenance management solution that we developed to solve that very point that you just made about not having visibility. But systems can be paper-based. I'll give you an example of when I used to own a couple of suite salons. These were large locations, commercial in, in a strip shopping center, two different locations. Each of them had four air conditioning units. And I kept seeing these invoices for uh, air conditioning repair. And I kept asking, well, didn't we just repair that unit last month or six months ago? We didn't really know. So what we created, the system we created was very simple. It was just a log. We identified each unit with a unique number, right? Simple enough. They already were numbered actually. And we'd logged in every time that we had a service call, we logged in the date and a summary of so that I at least wasn't losing my mind thinking, wait a second, we just replace that compressor or we just had that uh, fixed or flushed or cleaned or whatever it is that they're saying is wrong. And it gave us a tremendous amount of control over that spend, which was a big chunk of spend for us from a maintenance perspective. Right. And so that was a simple system and a good example of how you can start to have visibility to your point, because that's often what leads us to say, all right, so A, how much more money am I spending on this unit? Maybe I need to replace it or completely upgrade or overhaul it. B, am, you know, am, I, am I solving the real problem here or am I just throwing money at fixing things every time they come up? Yeah, exactly. And that's a great example, air conditioning units, uh, where you can be constantly fixing those and not realizing what's going on. Yeah. I mean, in our yogurt shop, it's our refrigeration equipment, right? That seems like there's always one malfunctioning from, from one week to the next. Yeah, exactly. And and sometimes the easiest thing for people to do, like you brought up, is, oh, let's just buy a new one. Let's just replace yep. them and go, well, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of things you want to consider before you buy a brand new one. I, I get people that want to buy brand new water pumps. I'm saying, well, we can fix these, you know, why don't we think about fixing these before we start in on that? But, you know, the difference between a $180 seal kit and a $2,500 pump is significant. Mm -hmm. And if you were just were throwing yeah. money at the problem, then yeah, you, you might, might solve it, but maybe you're spending more money than you need to. All right. Let's apply this and talk about this from, uh, from the people perspective. So a lot of times when you think about people being in the right position, sometimes, you know, if you're fixing a problem, you're constantly trying to get somebody to do something that they're not doing, then you sort of have to ask yourself, is it something that they're unwilling to do or something they're unable to do? And if it's something they're unable to do, it's certainly something you can you can address and try to fix uh, or try to solve the problem through training, through coaching to get them to perform at whatever level you're asking them to perform at or do whatever task or duties you're asking them to do. So those things can be addressed. But if it's, you know, if you're, you have somebody that's fundamentally not in the right position. So if you've got people that are frontline managers that might not be good with employees or might not be good with customers, for example, that's something that you can't necessarily fix. And you might have to solve that problem by moving that person to another position where they might not be interfacing with customers all the time because it's not their not their aptitude. It's not their personality. And it, no, no matter how much training or coaching or mentoring or threatening you do, uh, they're not going to, they're not going to change, change their, their basic personality. So that's, that's an example from, from a people perspective. I'm always asking my managers, is this something that can be fixed or is this something that we need to figure out how to solve? And solving, you know, could take a dramatically different approach than the typical coaching, mentoring, training process. What I would add to that as well, David, that you and I talk about often is solving it is also looking at our system, our process. So for example, we have someone who ends up not being good with customer service. Part of solving the problem is beyond just that one person, but what could we have done differently in the hiring process to have identified that in this person so that the next time we hopefully begin to avoid that. So that's 
part of solving it. Solving it is also, if I've got someone who's having, let's continue with the customer service example, they're not executing like we want them to. I Solving it is also looking at our training process. So it's it's looking at the, how can we improve how we got that person up to speed, how we train them, how we coach them, and what can we fix there that might be the real source of the problem, or at least part of the problem. Yeah, you and I are big about going back and saying, what did we do? How did we contribute to this problem? What do we need to do on our end to fix the problem? Well, you know, we, we, I believe we try to take responsibility for our, our end of it uh, more so than probably most people do. And because again, when it comes to people, the, the quick fix, although sometimes this is what you'd have to do, the quick fix is to say, well, that person doesn't fit. They have to go. And sometimes you do have to do that, right? There is, we'll talk about that, about the need to hire slowly and, and fire quickly. But that is also a cop out on our part, to your point. If you don't stop and say, well, what are our, what is our system doing? What is our process doing to put that person in the best position to succeed? What are we doing or what can we do better to make sure that we don't have that problem again? Yeah. You, you and I, when we hire somebody that might not work out for whatever reason, we always go back and say, okay, what, what indicators could we have seen that might've told us that this person wasn't going to be a good fit for this position? And we ask that question of our managers too, so that they're learning as well how to get better at hiring, how to get better at training. We often will look and say, well, maybe we need a different approach to how we're training on this particular aspect. And we've we've implemented and changed our systems that very way by looking at, okay, we had this problem, what's not in place? It could be as simple as, for example, when we uh, early on in our retail business, when we had a scam played on us from a change perspective, what did we do? I mean, we could have blamed everybody and 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 fired people, but instead, one of the things we primarily did is we put a procedure and training in place to help people avoid that scam, right? Right, right. So we could have fixed the problem by saying, oh, nobody te- nobody touches the register but the manager or nobody handles $100 bills by the manager. And that might be part of the solution, but really that's just fixing the, the symptom or the problem instead of putting in place a process or a procedure that hopefully solves it. Right. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a great example of that. So, you know, my encouragement is obviously as an owner, you're going to be thinking about these things more often because there's there's financial implications. If you're a manager, it, it's very helpful and you would increase your value quite a bit if you start thinking about are we fixing things or are we solving the problem? If you came to your manager or came to your owner and said, I think we ought to do this because I think this solves the problem instead of fixing it all the time. I think that's a good you know, that's a great skill to have. And then if you're you're working at the car wash, I think it's really important for you to think about this as well, although it's harder to do it. But I think you would really increase your value quite a bit to your team if you're thinking about how do we solve problems so we don't have a, that issue again. All right. Great stuff. Fixing versus solving something like you said that we must be thinking about constantly as owners, but we need to be instilling and teaching our managers and the rest of our staff to think that way. Wonderful. Thanks for listening to this episode. This is Henry Lopez, and that was David Begin. We look forward to having you join us on the next episode of our show. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.